All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are live for Happy Hour. Thanks for stopping by. Welcome to PT Pinecast, a podcast that saves physical therapists like you from missing out on amazing insight, remarkable ideas, and motivational stories in the world of physical therapy. I'm Jimmy McKay, your host tonight. A great show for you tonight. We have four ladies from Texas State University on the show to talk about research they conducted uh, as students. Uh, before we get going, I want to make sure you guys know, uh, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast uh, on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, uh, Stitcher Radio, a lot of different places you can find the show. That's the audio version. And now we're doing these video casts on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. That is at PT Pinecast on the socials. Your first round is brought to you by Owens Recovery Science. They're a single source for PTs looking for certification in personalized blood uh, blood flow restriction rehabilitation training and the uh, the certification and equipment. You need to apply it properly in your clinical practice. Uh, Johnny Owens, Kyle Kimbrell, just on the show not long ago, they're, uh, they got classes in uh, BFR all over the country. Really cool locations. I was on there just kind of peeking. Maybe I can drop in. Uh, New Orleans, going to do Falls Church, Virginia. They're going to be out in San Diego. So check it out online, owensrecoveryscience.com. They've also got their own podcast. If you want to get really deep with the guys and gals from Owens Recovery Science, check them out uh, on iTunes, the Owens Recovery Science podcast. Uh, Comments, questions during the show, feel free, interactive, or if you're watching the replay, we monitor those things too. Uh, Right below, questions, comments, ask. We'll bring those on screen if we can, and uh, just let us know where you're watching or listening. Drop us that. Uh, Your name, where you're watching from, what you like, or what you want to hear of in the future. That's what we want to do. But let's, let's do this. Let's get the intense music. Here we go. Our guest tonight, are from Texas State University while SPTs there. They conducted research on the experiences of black students in physical therapy education in Texas, a qualitative study. Please welcome Marcia, Amy Marie, Andrea, and Stephanie to the show. And as you magically just pop onto the screen, (laughs) isn't that fantastic? Wow. (laughs) Uh, Wanted to say welcome. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, uh, so first of all, congratulations, because you guys did this research we're going to talk about tonight as students, and you are now students no more. Is that correct? That is yes. correct. Yes. We yes. Well, congratulations there. <laughs> that's a 2020. Deserves uh, definitely a cheers. We, uh, we get the stuff that's difficult out of the way, right? So whenever you're taking a nice long test, you want to make sure you have the, uh, the hardest questions first so you can really apply your, your brain power. Uh, first question, always the hardest. Uh, what are we drinking tonight, ladies? Ooh. I have wild first. basin. Oh, you think? <laughs> oh, I'm having a pina colada. Pina colada, getting lost mm-hmm. in the rain. I like it. Uh, Andrea, <laughs> what do you got? So it's pretty much juice. Uh, it's Angry Orchard. Uh, hard cider. <laughs> Andrea, <laughs> this, is nice. a pop question. this is a pop quiz. I know it, I didn't prep you for this, but do you know where Angry Orchard is actually uh, produced? Mm. Um, no, um, it tastes good, though. <laughs> it tastes good. My hometown It's where I am right now. It's in oh. Walden, New York. Thank you for keeping a local business in my area. <laughs> in Angry Orchard. Uh, <laughs> And go ahead. What else? What else are we drinking? Yeah, I'm drinking some red wine. I didn't have my favorite Dos Equis, so we're going to resort to that. All right, I like it. I'm doing that <laughs> at uh, number nine from the state of Vermont. I'm doing Ooh. that because I have this weird thing. If there's one, if there's one beer left of a kind, I just got to get rid of it. I can't just have that lone soldier sitting there. Oh. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll do a cheers to you guys into the webcam. Let's uh, let's let's clink glasses. There we go. <laughs> And she, thanks so much for coming by and talking to us about this. Uh, we want to make sure that the hard work that you've done gets shared with the PT world. So uh, let's get started and dig into this. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, Steph. Mm-hmm. Steph, give us the intro. What'd you do? Why'd you do it? And feel free to elaborate on why you guys thought it was so important to devote some of your time and effort as students to this. Um, first of all, I just want to say thanks for having us. We're honored to be here and we are all very, very passionate about this. So we're super excited to share. Um, to give a little background, like you kind of mentioned, this research was done our full last year of PT school um, as part of our analysis of practice requirements. Um, so it actually started the year before us and then we kind of continued on and did a few more focus groups. Um, 
But I think in order to fully explain why we thought it was important and kind of the bigger picture, it's important to look at it from more of a societal context. Um, so to put it in perspective, over the past 10 years, there's been a significant change in the demographics of the United States. Um, there's been an increase in racial and ethnic minorities, but in many healthcare professions, including PT, we haven't seen that representation. So for example, in 2018, only 1.5% 1 of physical therapists were black compared oh. to about 13% of the population. Um, and I know some people might say like, so what, why does that matter? Um, or does it even matter? And the answer is yes. Uh, research shows that when you have a white doctor treating minority patients, often they rate their quality of care lower, their communication lower, um, and ultimately their outcomes. And then on the contrary side of that, when you have a provider that matches the cultural diversity in the community, the outcomes are better. So if our goal as PTs is to improve the health of society, then this is something that we should care about. Um, and the reasons for why we see this underrepresentation are kind of multifactorial, and that could be a whole nother discussion. But one of the contributing factors is absolutely the underrepresentation seen in physical therapy programs. So in 2017, only 3.8% of SPTs were black, um, which is a very, they're one of the most underrepresented populations in PT programs. Um, and I don't think until we understand their experiences, we'll fully understand how to incorporate diversity and inclusion and equity in PT programs. Um, so that's kind of why we decided to look into this a little bit further. There's not really any evidence out there. There's one study, I think, that was done in the UK about the experiences of black students, and it was kind of formatted similarly to ours, but there's definitely not enough research. So with that, we decided to kind of take a look at the qualitative experiences of black PT students in Texas. Um, and our insights that we gained from it were really powerful. Great setup. I like that. I mean, you really, you, you covered all the bases of, of, of why someone would want to pay attention um, and you did it well. We're going to bring in uh, Amy now. So in terms of barriers to enrollment, what did you face and did you see any of this coming? Yes. Yeah, so that is actually our first theme. It was titled Systemic Barriers and it brought to light the various obstacles that black students prior, well, they, that they had prior to applying to the program, right? So when we asked them to share their I don't think she's pausing. I think she might actually just be frozen. All right. Oh, no. we'll, of role models. We'll see if we can get uh, Amy. Uh, can you still hear us? I kind of sum that up. And it states, one student stated, applying for PT school is expensive. Spending all that money tra on traveling and interview fees and deposits, a, min a minority is more likely to not even afford that, which would deter them from even applying in the first place. So I think there's already a barrier. You're going to get less applicants off the bat. And as mentioned, the underexposure of role models of similar racial or ethnic backgrounds also played a barrier to this. And one student went as far to say that, I can't tell you a time when I've ever had a black doctor, anything, no type of medical help from anybody black working on my mouth, working on my body, anything, nobody, not one. So when we start to look at all these comments, we get we begin to see that this leads to the lack of early professional mentorship, also the poor awareness of the PT profession in itself, and sometimes even the loss of interest in applying to PT programs. Yeah, we lost we lost you just just for a couple seconds, but I think I think we got you know the 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 importance of that, which is if there's no one to to model after, um, you know, th then why would someone want to go into a profession where they don't feel you know represented? And also, um, in your own experiences, if you don't see that, it wouldn't feel like that's a a welcoming environment for for right. someone who doesn't who doesn't look like those providers. And and you're saying yeah, yeah. in your experience, you never experienced that. I can't say that I have either. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Mentorship is yeah. probably the key role in there. If you don't know how to even start the process, then how do you end up in this position, right? Right. Knowledge is power there. And if someone can, even if someone can just answer some of your questions, they don't have to map things out for you. But if you have don't okay. have anybody you feel, you feel comfortable enough being vulnerable with to ask those yeah. questions... There's no wonder that people aren't uh, people aren't making their way to to areas when when they don't look like the people who are already there. That's yeah. going to be a giant barrier to enrollment. Uh, anything anything else in that topic? I want to make sure we we hit that really really well before before we move on to anything. 
Yeah, I, mean, I, like about it. I also wanted to mention a lot of the people in the focus group talked about how their families might be emotionally supportive or supportive of their mm -hmm. goals, but they might be first generation college graduates. So their parents don't know how to help in the more practical aspects of applications, and essays and all of that. And that's a lot, like, let's be honest, that's a beast in and of itself. So if you don't have anyone close to you that can kind of help you and lead the way, then you're already starting out at a disadvantage. Yeah, you yeah. want to talk about assumptions. Um, I just assume everybody in the country is even because uh, myself and my friends and the people in my circle, well, we're all pretty, we're all pretty even. So like this yeah. must be what it's like everywhere. But if you're someone who's never applied to college, that is, well, that's daunting in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, and if the people that are closest to you can't even give you the first step to go into, and again, back to, you know, barriers to enrollment, there's no one you can, you're vulnerable enough to ask for help. There's no wonder it never starts. Yes. Absolutely. All right. And then even before asking for help, like one person has to know that physical therapy is a profession in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so if you have no mm -hmm. role models, if you don't know anyone that looks like you in this position, like you might not even like find out that physical therapy is a thing until like your senior year of undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like another thing that also plays into why we see this underrepresentation of minority later down the line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something that gets brought up a lot in terms of communications and marketing within within PT uh, on the individual therapist level, as well as the APTA is making sure the public is well aware of what the profession is, can do for you and, and all those different facets. I mean, we've said okay. before on the show, uh, one of our greatest strengths is we do so much for so many. And one of our greatest weaknesses is we do so much for so many that it's hard to put it and encapsulate it in one okay. short um, sort kind of log line, some, some quick uh, branding. But uh, of course, if you don't know the profession exists probably not going to make your way to it either yeah mm -mm. exactly yeah. all right uh let's move on a little bit we're going to bring in uh mercia we'll stay with you uh, prejudice and microaggressions that came up in your research as well talk about that with me yes definitely and before i talk about it i want to backtrack a little bit to our methods and like how we did like what we did um so like a quick summary is we basically hosted focus groups in um, the city of San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas, and one on Zoom online. Uh, we did it over two years, and then um, during the first year, we had some help from uh, some amazing girls. They're not with us tonight, but um, shout out to Brittany, and Katie, and Bria, and Sarah, and Danielle, because they did awesome work. And then we picked it up in the second year. So, shout out to them. So. so that's kind of like how we ended up with the data that we have like with you today. Uh, but yeah, essentially, after asking questions about barriers to enrollment, we kind of like dive deeper into now asking questions about barriers while in the programs. And so we listened to the students' answers, and some of the some of them had a lot of negative things to say. And so we kind of like use that and um, name that theme prejudice and microaggressions, um, because the stories that they shared like ranged all the way from like stereotypes to unfortunately racism. So we had students sharing with us um, how one of the stereotypes they felt like they were under was that there was an assumed inferiority that was attributed to them because they were black. So some of them felt like um, people would rate them like lower than others in their head because they were black and would assume that they were not as equally intelligent um, or would just see them as a token. So some, those were some of the stereotypes that they talked about. And then they moved to more like overt microaggression. So we had a student that she was in her interview for PT school. She was standing in line and there was another black girl that, was, that she was next to. And when the black girl got called for her interview, she had another one of the applicants tell her, I wonder which one of you will get in to be the designated black girl. And so that really impacted her because from that point on, she felt like it doesn't matter what I've done, it doesn't matter that I have a 4.0 in um, undergrad, for some people, all they're gonna see is the color of my skin. And the reason I'm here is just like one more token to just like be put here. Um, and then some of them shared about racism. So we had a student talked about how during one of her clinical, she was told to not go to a patient's room because the patient did not want to be treated by a black person. So overall, there was a wide spectrum of both micro and macroaggressions from um, stereotypes, prejudice, and then unfortunately all the way to racism. When, uh, when you guys were conducting these, how'd that feel in the room 
to hear these stories. But first of all, kudos on you guys for making someone feel comfortable. As someone who's interviewed people a couple thousand times, that's really the hardest part. That's your job as an interviewer. So kudos to you for making them feel so comfortable that they could tell you these things because it's got to be very difficult to reveal those no matter what environment you're in. Mm -hmm. How'd that feel in the room for you ladies? So um, I was the one that was the focus group facilitator. So in the room, it was just me and the other students. Um, and we kind of did this by design in an attempt to like make people feel more comfortable if they were mm -hmm. asked questions by someone that was also black. Yeah. Um, the stories that were shared, honestly, it was just a really powerful moment. I felt like for a lot of the participants, it was their first time being in a room with so many PT students that looked like mm -hmm. them because a lot of them in the class is just one or two people. So I felt like from the get go, people felt like they could breathe. And as they were sharing stories, people would share more and more story like, oh, this happened to me too. Oh, I'm not the only one. This happened to me and I had no one to talk to you about it. Now I can share it. So I'd say it was, it was a heavy atmosphere, but there was also comfort in that heaviness because people in the room could relate. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. But I think that really reinforces mm -hmm. everything that you guys were covering was this, mm -hmm. was this was the first room they were in where everybody was studying like them and looked like them. I don't know what yeah, that's yeah. like because I've always been in the room like that. In my class, I pretty yep. much looked like most of my classmates at all times. I never had to I, I never had that room where finally I was there and I could breathe. I've always had that. Yep. And I didn't notice that. And, but you guys pointing that out makes me notice that. Mm -hmm. And you can sense it, like even just from listening. Like I wasn't there, obviously, but we all listened to the transcripts independently. Mm -hmm. um, and even just listening, you were like, wow, you know, like that. I had some sense of it, but hearing it firsthand, you're just like, damn, like we need to do better. Yeah. Because it's sad that this is what it takes for them to feel understood and supported. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you you want to add from from those interviews, those collecting? I mean, I, I like how you you, you highlighted um, really an example of what a microaggression is because I think that's very very buzz and newsworthy right now. Right, mm -hmm. people are throwing around the term, but giving it in form of a narrative will let people remember what that is. Maybe educate them on hey, um, make sure you're aware that if you're either thinking or if you're going to say this, um, that's what that is. And someone is going to be affected by that more than you probably think. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Anything else from those yeah. uh, from those interviews you wanted you guys wanted to add or hear in the transcripts? Mm, I'll say that one of the things I was going to mention this at the end, but I'll mention it here that because it's worth mentioning more than once. I'll say that um, is one incident a participant was talking about an experience of racism, and I believe the context was that a classmate had used the N-word around them in their presence. And they were like, so now I'm sitting here uncomfortably and I have to decide whether I'm gonna speak up and call them out on it or if I'm gonna stay silent and just kind of tolerate it. Yeah. And he said, mm -hmm. man, I wish right now one of my white friends would have spoken up. And that has that's yeah. stuck with me from that day forward. Um, and I would like to think that I'm someone that speaks up, but you know, you really, really got to think about it from a different perspective. To you, it might not seem all that harmful, but to someone else, it absolutely is. And we have to call it out too. It can't just be the people that are affected by it being called right. out. Right, and we can get into that. And that's 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 yeah. being not racist or being an ally. There's the difference. Mm -hmm. right? Am I gonna make a big yeah. deal out of this? Yep. What was the big deal? Right. Then it should be made a big deal of, mm -hmm. right? And I understand that you mm -hmm. have that, some of us might have that choice, right? We have that decision. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're being affected by it, you don't have that choice. It, it's affected. Yeah. So yeah. If, if anybody else sits there silent, you're allowing it. You're mm -hmm. proliferating that. Mm -hmm. And that is the root cause. That, that's, that's the root at the root of that. It's not right. Mm -mm. Uh, Mercia, thank you so much for covering that part. Uh, let's go to the third theme of your research from Texas State University. Social, uh, social isolation and assumed universality. A lot of syllables there, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so social isolation was pretty much interweaved through 
a lot of our patient experiences. Um, and it's a pretty hefty theme, so I'm going to talk for a little bit, of, a little while. Um, so it was pretty much an umbrella term, social isolation for underrepresentation, as mentioned before. There's lack of support from faculty and also peers, and this assumed universality that I will co cover at the end. So I'll try to give a little bit of information about each kind of subtopic. So with underrepresentation, just straight up from the interviews, as Marcia had mentioned, like there was there was this feeling of like, I'm just filling a spot. Like I'm just here to make this program more diverse by comments like, I wonder who will be the next designated black girl, the next designated black person. And I would like to share one of our uh, participants said, like what made me stand out a little bit more than they did? Because at this point, if you're just picking a spot holder, could it just be random? Did you just pick anyone to make the picture more colorful? And so they kind of felt like it was this competition within the few black people that were applying pretty much. Um, and so that was starting off with underrepresentation, this initial social isolation. And then it kind of continued on with um, lack of support from faculty. There was one participant that truly stood out to me and it was this experience where she was in clinicals and she saw that her clinical instructor was using racist remarks against a patient. And so she pretty much went to her to her faculty and she was like, hey, like this was not really appropriate. It made me feel really uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do about it. And the faculty said, okay, uh, we just won't send minority students there anymore. And so the student was just like, hey, like this is not just because I'm black, like this is just not appropriate for any student, whether it's the majority or the minority. So it was situations like that, that I was just like, I don't feel the support. Um, and then in general, a lot of students felt lonely within the class. So one student shared, there's been days I've just been like, I don't know if I really want to do this anymore. Like, I just feel so alone. And I just find like, there's power in just sharing the words of these students. Like another student that said, I have to put a bigger a bigger effort in getting to know people compared to them trying to get to know me. So that's something that I de I definitely noticed as well. It's awkward. It's definitely awkward when you have to sit there and you're you're the black person. So mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of them experience this balance between the I believe Mercia mentioned it earlier, like standing up to this discriminatory remarks, but also not wanting to be seen as this militant black person or this person that calls calls everything out about race, but then also not wanting their experiences or their concerns to be like continuously dismissed. And lastly, it was uh, assumed universality. So pretty much this is saying that all black people are the same. So it's it's putting this pressure on one person to be the spoke pro person for their whole race. And this was co constantly shared about in different ways of just being the only person in the room. And so it was highlighted when professors would point out black students in class to make a point to ask them questions about oh, how right. is it how is it uh this black experience in healthcare and it was just a lot of pressure on those those students um and so one participant shared about this and i'll read it verbatim and it says in classes sometimes professors don't mean it badly but you have to talk about race and situations and things that could happen in a clinical setting and when you're the only one that's not white in a room you know they're about to ask you because no one else is there so i just wanted to highlight that because it's like placing this large magnifying glass on this one person. Their every action represents their race It's and it's a lot of pressure on them and it affects their wellness, it affects their grades because they already have a lot of pressure in being in PT sure. school in general. So mm -hmm. yeah. so when you talked about, I, I want to unpack some of that because yes. there's a lot, a lot there. When you talk about that that lack of support from faculty or lack of support from, mm -hmm. from, from colleagues or, or classmates, is that lack of education? What, 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 why is that or why, why do you think that is from, from, from all the research that, that you did? Yeah, so there was definitely a few like moments of when they did feel support, but I think largely it was a lot of not feeling the support. And I think it was, I think a lot of it has to do with unconscious biases. Like sometimes classmates don't know that they're saying these things or professors don't know that pointing out a student in class puts that pressure on them. And so I think it's a lot of that and just not conversations being had and, and just not knowing in general. I think a, a lot of these situations, maybe that I don't believe the professors or classmates were being harmful or trying to be, it was just not being aware. Right. It goes back to what's not being said, which is yeah. what we mentioned earlier in terms of a microaggression is the thing that you're saying, pointing one person out to be the representative for a race or a gender mm -hmm. or ethnicity or a religion. Like 
you can't do that, right? You can speak from, you really can speak from one person's perspective. Mm -hmm. You can speak from, I've experienced this as a insert, whatever I, but really it's, you're, you're speaking from your own perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that really, I mean, I don't know, education right there would be, Hey, how would you feel if this were reversed? I'm talking Mm -hmm. about faculty. I'm talking about students. Um, Education seems like the only thing that's going to probably change this, but it, it, it needs to be consistent. You need to be going back to the last thing we talked about. You need to be willing to point it out and make this thing that is a big deal known without, Mm -hmm. I mean, but listen, you also brought this up. You have to make it sure like you're not seeming militant or I'm taking a stand or I'm going to ruin the vibe Mm -hmm. in this room or, Hey, just lighten up. How do you do that? I I don't know, but we need to get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think Jimmy, besides like lack of education, I think, Truly, that lack of support was because of lack of understanding. Mm. And so diversity, like equity and inclusion issues are so interesting because it's this one topic where like everything that we do in life, like usually we reach understanding by relating. Like, you know, you like I'm struggling. I'm a first year student. I'm stressed out. Like I've come to you and you're like, hey, like I went through it. I was a first year student to you. So like you understand me because you relate. When it comes to diversity issue, this is the one thing where it doesn't matter what you do, like you you have an experience as a white person, I have an experience as a black person, you can't relate to what I say, mm-hmm. but you need to try to understand. And so I think it's besides lack of education, which I think education is so important. I think it's also people understanding that like, hey, like, okay, let me take this out of my lens. Let me try to take this outside of everything that I know because everything that I know has nothing to do with the experience of the person in front of me. Mm-hmm. Let me listen and try to understand despite the fact that I can't relate. I think that's that's an important point too. Yeah. Absolutely. This goes back to an episode we did with a real close and a, a personal friend of mine who's a doctor of clinical psychology talking mm-hmm. about the difference between empathy and sympathy. Telling you that I understand exactly what you're going through when I do not know exactly what you're going through is disingenuous and lets okay. you know that I'm just trying to fill you know the air with 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 words and and get, have you get over it. Um, if I don't understand what you're going through, you can have empathy. In fact, emotional intelligence is probably something we should figure out how to make sure that it's installed in anybody who comes into the physical therapy or any health profession. Yeah, absolutely. Um, emotional intelligence and empathy. I can't sympathize. I haven't done that. Mm-hmm. But I can sure empathize. And you're going to need that not only with classmates and coworkers, but you're going to need that with patients a mm-hmm. lot. Mm-hmm. You need to be good at that. Um, Marcia, how, how, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's go to theme four, uh, code switching. I'll be honest. Never heard of this term until the APTA's student exchange essay with nice. um, Michael Cromarty. And uh, he's been on the show before. We already booked him. <laughs> if you're after watching, uh, be prepared to talk about this. He brought this term up. He encouraged people to go listen to a particular podcast uh, on iTunes as well. I believe it was produced by NPR. I downloaded it, mm-hmm. but I wanted you to talk about this theme that came up in your research, which is code switching. So give it, give us the the macro to the micro on that. Yeah, you know what's interesting is I hadn't heard of the term either until Michael published his article about a year and a half ago. Hi. He published it and I read it and it spoke to my soul and I was <laughs> like, this is like everything I've been feeling. But um, essentially like code switching is just altering your language, your behaviors or your actions uh, to match the environment around you in an attempt to fit in. And so code switching, to me was by far the most interesting thing that we had. Because with everything else that the participants talked about, there was this like, oh yeah, like I agree, yeah, I feel this. Code switching is where we really got to see the differences in the students. Um, We really got to see them share a little bit more about their stories um, and how they varied versus like, whether they were raised in a white neighborhood, uh, whether they went to an HBCU, History Black College or University, or a primarily white institution, they all varied in their journey. And so some of them felt like PT school was just this constant code switch, meaning that they couldn't fully be themselves while they were in school, and then they would just go home um, with their family or like their black friends and then just be who they really were. So I want to share a quote um, from one of the participants. He said, I learned that you can talk a certain way. You can say certain stuff. Like the way I've talked to you guys, I wouldn't be able to talk to other people. You know what I mean? 
the way I dress, I have to always be cognizant of that and everything just plays in. So I could not, I couldn't, I couldn't be, I couldn't be black. Um, and then another student was talking about like her beauty school environment and she said, I felt like this space wasn't made for me to be all of myself. But then on the other hand, we also had other participants sharing about how when they got into PT school, they decided, hey, I'm going to be unapologetically black in everything that I do, even if that means being isolated and having less friends, like this is who I'm going to be. So that was definitely an interesting theme. Um, we all saw how they were on different part of their journey from I'm code switching because this is my survival mechanism, this is how I fit in, to I'm tired, I've done this my whole life, like now just take me as I am, this is, this is who I am. <laughs> Um, so really interesting theme. Um, and also another thing that was interesting about that is how a lot of them felt like even the code switching is something negative because this is students talking about how they can't fully be themselves. A lot of them felt like it also gave them like a relational superpower. They felt like because they were a good code switcher, they were more empathetic and adaptable clinicians. They felt like they could mold the personality of any patients because the entire life was spent practicing how to be around and like people that are not like them. So yeah, definitely different facets to it. Definitely something that's mm -hmm. really interesting to uncover. Hey, that, that, that quote that you, that you shared where you said, uh, this person, I, I'm going to be unapolo uh, unapologetically black, even if that means isolation, like yeah. that cripples me right there. Like mm -hmm. I'm deciding to be who I am. Even mm -hmm. though I and they're 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 foreshadowing, or at least I think by doing this, I will most likely alienate myself and I'll, I'll be socially isolated. Like that, if that doesn't like if that doesn't bother you, there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. And you did see, you did see some students also sharing about how sometimes were well, like they did not code switch, they felt like they were misunderstood with their lingo. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we had a friend talking about how. Um, like the way that he talks, um, he like professors would come to him and tell him like, oh, you seem very passionate, you know? They felt like he was talking like loudly or with extra passion, where that's just like the way that he normally expresses himself. So for the students that chose to not code switch, um, some of them felt like people just don't get me or like they misinterpret like what I say or they misinterpret how I say it. So it's, it's a hard balance to find. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They were, they, they were being told, probably through a microaggressive way, that you probably should be more like this and less like mm -hmm. this. So if you could yeah. tone it down or if you could bring it in over here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that can't feel good because acting or being something you're not, that's exhausting. Mm -hmm. yes. and, I to, and I wanted to be clear, after Michael Cromarty uh, mentioned this in the exchange essay, um, conversation, which is beautifully done by by the way, well hosting uh, job yeah. from from Usura. Um, yeah. It's it's not um, it's not what what code switching is because I when I first read it I was like oh my gosh I'm guilty of this because I typically as an interviewer or as a PT or me that's just my personality what I try to do is I try to be I try to mimic or or try to make the other person feel comfortable uh -huh. um, because I want them to kind of relax. But what I'm doing is short, very, very short term for interactions. Code switching is changing your personality long term and how you express mm -hmm. yourself in certain situations. So those two things, I think anyway, they were different to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's research about it too. Um, they've researched and seen how clinical instructors rate different students. And it was the same exact script and it was performed either by a white student or a non-white student. Really? And consistently, the non-white students got perceived as like lower or less well-spoken than the, their white counterparts, despite the fact that it was the exact same script. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's right. not just something that people are experiencing in their day-to-day -day lives, it's also something that is happening. It's consistent, right? If it's showing you the research. All right. So code switching, Mercia, thank you so much. Uh, let's go to theme number five, the pressure to improve diversity and the search for allyship. We're going to talk to Steph and, uh, and Amy are going to cover that. Yes. Um, so in presenting our research, we didn't want to only talk about the negative aspects of what we found. We also wanted to portray all of it, including the positive light. Um, and part of that was 
a lot of students talked about creating or participating in organizations that were diversity focused, um, which is amazing. And it was inspiring to hear that a lot of them created the organizations themselves, whether it was in the PT department or if it was with other healthcare professionals. And a lot of what they talked about was finding a sense of community and a place where they could talk, have those tough conversations and kind of talk about their classes and everything else and be them, their full selves, um, which was amazing. But on, on the other side of that, it's like these students shouldn't be the ones that are responsible for creating that for themselves. Right. This is a problem that we as a whole created. They shouldn't have to find the solution while they're in the midst of PT exams and everything else because everyone knows that PT school is stressful. So it was really cool to kind of hear their different ideas and how they did it because everyone did it a little bit differently, kind of specific mm -hmm. to their programs and what was already there. Um, and a lot of them also talked about outreach and kind of going forward, how they wanted to use those organizations to go to lower income high schools or middle schools or elementary schools and show students like, hey, we're black SPTs and this is what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that needs to be looked at at more of an institutional level, not these students taking it upon themselves. Right. It's uh, just, I mean, you're, you're describing systemic uh, issues. One yep. person cannot change a system. You can't do it. You need a lot of people, not and especially not just the people being affected by the yes. systemic issue. You need exactly. people who are not affected, people who are on the sidelines who could be quiet and it really wouldn't it really wouldn't change their lives. They need to be part of the change. Or exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. And so to follow Stephanie, the search for allyship was also a common sub theme within this theme itself. And it was just expressing, these students were expressing that despite always feeling maybe socially isolated, there were many accounts when they actually had peers or even faculty members that were actually aiming for a more inclusive environment and kind of aiding in their help, well, helping them to kind of establish whether these organizations or just having some comfortable like place to talk and talk about their experiences and what they've been feeling. And so allies were described as being accepting, encouraging, and uplifting in times of frustration or stressful situations in PT school. And they also provided comfortable spaces for conversations. They provided a sense of belonging, understanding, and willingness to learn, which is like the biggest thing about allyship, right? Is always the willingness to learn. We see this in many accounts when one student even says, hopefully everyone at least has one person, right? I have an Hispanic brother. I mean, he might as well be black. He is culturally aware and he's cultu culturally intelligent. And another student mentioned that she had found comfort in one um, African-American professor within the program where she knew that she could get along with this professor because she'd be able to relate to her and her situations within the program. So it just brings to light that despite that social isolation, there was some type of positivity that these students felt. but. These accounts of allyship are very much smaller in the sense that it didn't happen in every case that we encountered, right? So not every student had the, I guess, the availability to have that person that they could confide in. And it was very, very, very minute in certain cases. Yeah. Yeah. So you're highlighting a few of the of the positive aspects, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you're you're also noting how infrequent those positives were. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, well done on that. Uh, one of my favorite parts of any project is the uh, the conclusion. What did we learn? <laughs> um, who wants to talk about the conclusions and the limitations uh, right. in this project specifically? Um, so I'll talk about our limitations a little bit. Obviously, we were limited only to Texas. Um, we figured that was probably the most reasonable just from a logistical standpoint. Um, we... we reached out to program directors and had them reach out to their students to and have them respond to us if they were interested, but not every program director sent out that email. So we didn't even capture all of the Texas students. So this, the small sample size was definitely something that influenced us. Um, and then just the, we all have our personal biases and because it was a qualitative study, we read all the transcripts ourselves and came up with the themes and then agreed on the themes. So we tried our best to kind of independently decide on the themes and then agree, but that's obviously gonna introduce some bias as well. Sure. Um, so we're hoping to expand that going forward, but we did have 19 people, so it was a decent size. 
And then also something that you're talking about in terms of let let's say a student did find out about this, mm-hmm. talking about these things is not easy. Yeah. Or maybe you don't you don't you don't feel comfortable sharing that with other yep. people because this is it's a serious issue. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe you feel it make it might negatively affect you somewhere Absolutely. down the line. Imagine that if someone yeah. being honest, but fearing that this might negatively affect you somewhere down the line if you're not acting a certain way. Yeah, we tried our best to exclude any details that would give away the student programs or where they were located or professors or anything like that. Um, but given that there's so few black students, it's not right. that hard to figure out, honestly. Right. right. All right, and to, yeah, so to sum it up, this qualitative study is actually unique in the sense that it's one of its kind to really lay out all this information, right? And it provides us with insight that black students are subject to unique experiences and system, with systemic barriers being one of the major themes that we had along with both macro and microaggressions, social isolation, code switching, and then pressures to improve diversity, and finally that search for allyship. So this inf- information provides insight into the ways that physical therapy educators can support the success of black students in physical therapy programs by providing a more inclusive learning environment, right? And also providing an environment that promotes and celebrates that diversity. Well said. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks for recognizing this because you'd mentioned at the top of the show this this was worth this was two years worth of work collectively. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yes, it is. Good on you for recognizing this two years ago. You know, back in, in 2018, um, mm-hmm. from either personal experience or um, from hearing about this from, cla- from your classmates or colleagues throughout your lives and seeing it, and saying, "Hey, this is not o- this is not only a thing. Um, this is so important that we should really dedicate." our time and effort and energy into to figuring out what's actually going on here. And then ultimately, right, people will use this and say, well, what do we need to do about it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and we definitely have to give a shout out to our research uh, supervisor, Dr. Jennifer Hill. Uh, she's the one who kind of like got all of this started two years ago. And um, more than anyone, like she recognized it. I feel like she's recognized it for like a really, really long time. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, definitely shout out to her mm-hmm. as well. We'll have uh, we're, we're looking to have her on the show uh, sometime soon. Um, anything else you guys wanted to throw out there before we get to the really hard stuff, which is like parting shots and answering fun questions? <laughs> anything about this experience um, surprise you? Change you? Um, you know, did you did you learn something that completely caught you off guard? I really love when people go in and they think because it's it's natural. I, I expect it to be like this, and then all of a sudden you get hit with something that you didn't expect. Anything like that happen? Mm. Well, for me in general, I had I had always loved uh, learning about diversity and everything, but I had never fully jumped in and so in detail learned about all these experiences. So like I myself didn't really know what code switching was. I didn't know a lot of these concepts, assumed universality. I was like, I don't know what that is. Never right. heard of it. So the fact that it was so repetitively said throughout all these hours and hours of audios from these students, like that was impactful to me in general. And the fact that, hey, like race might, it might be kind of uncomfortable to talk to talk about but you got to become comfortable you got to learn and that's what I learned is to learn is to just put yourself and just right. listen to these people and listen to their voices so yeah yeah many many talking about um, the conversations around uh, civil unrest diversity yeah. equity equity inclusion um, and how long uh, an American news cycle is and when is the next thing going to come um, and that's sad. Uh-huh. To say that, well, how long is this going to stick around? Um, yeah. Hopefully, right. uh, it'll stick around long enough for it to change, and then yeah. it will fade out of the news cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, exactly. I want to make sure you guys got a chance. Anything else that you guys wanted to mention, either Stephanie or Marcia or uh, Marie? Uh, I think for me, there wasn't anything like surprising per se, because I felt like I, I shared like a lot of the same experiences. And so listening to and talking to the students, it was like, oh, Yes, I feel seen and I feel understood. Um, I think um, the surprise was more in, I guess, like sharing this and just realizing how, like so many people had no idea. Okay. Some of the faculty like sharing with them um, and realizing like, wow, like all students are really going through this? And the answer is yes. And okay. so not every student might feel comfortable speaking up, you know, especially if you're like the only black kid in the class, like yeah. you sometimes you're just trying to blend in and just survive. Um, I mean, this so, is PT school. You're trying to, yeah. I mean, you're trying to pass the next. Yes, <laughs> yes. You have this other thing hanging over your head that can't make it easier. Yeah. Yes. yes. 
And so, um, of course, everyone is different. Everyone's experience is different. But if some people are faculty members and listening to this and thinking like, oh, surely my students are not feeling this way. Like, they are. <laughs> they are. Mm-hmm. Most, likely that, most likely they are. So I think that's my... And I like my my thought from the from the research is just the power of seeing how we can all be so different, but then still like agree like wow like you felt this I felt this too. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I mean Oprah said it right. Every person wants to be seen and heard and understood. And if yeah. you see someone but you're not you're not really hearing them and you're not understanding them, they're going to yeah. feel isolated yeah. and to get. Yeah. To get through, maybe they do. Maybe they do code switch because they recognize this isn't. I'm not going to change you, mm-hmm. but I need to survive. I need to get through this experience. Right. I think also what was surprising to me is like I expected maybe the prejudice and the microaggressions, the stories of like co- like classmates using the N word. I was shocked. Like mm-hmm. we are in a doctoral program. I understand that people have been raised in different areas, but I thought that in 2020, that was something that was like pretty commonly understood, but that's not okay. So I think it was more so the depth and the extent of it was what honestly shocked me and made me really sad. Like mm-hmm. this is, we've come a long way, but we still have so, so, so much work to do. I, yeah. I, think, yeah. I think a lot of people think we've come a lot further than we we have because yeah. I think there, I, I, I think talking about these things publicly or privately mm-hmm. makes some people very uncomfortable yep. and then and then actual colors come out true colors right. come out yeah. in that situation and there are a lot of people having uncomfortable conversations with their friends and their family and some of these aren't turning out well um and that's okay yeah, yeah. 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 I, I was gonna go off of that actually I mean this study alone has brought up multiple conversations not only within my family but within my close friends and whatnot, right? So it's it's been a good study to kind of get that ball rolling on conversations that should have happened many, 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 many years ago, right? Yeah. And so it's shed a lot of light just being a part of this study and learning from these students' experiences because it is important and it has been important. But finally, maybe it just needed this little push and needed this paper to be published. But I'm glad it's now happening and these conversations are being had or done or made or whatever you want to say but it's it's time and it's been time so i'm really glad that this paper is kind of just throwing that out there and shining light on it it's been time i like that yeah. right. uh you guys ready for three questions no pressure yes all right let's do three <laughs> right now here we go All right, three questions brought to you by our friends from Aureus Medical Staffing. That's A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. Uh, leaders in travel physical therapy, uh, short-term assignments, long-term assignments. If you want to take that PT license and use it like a license to go anywhere you want, you can do that. Uh, the beach, that's your jam. <laughs> if you want to go to Alaska, Hawaii, Florida, Maine, I mean, the, the corners of the U.S., all 50 states in Washington, D.C., uh, see what they have to offer. This is not like you signing up for like military service where it's like we go where, where we tell you to go. Uh, just see what's available. So A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. I'm going to change three questions up since we've got four of you. All right. I'm going to ask you all the same question. And I didn't prep you for this. <laughs> what does success look like to you guys about this issue, about what you studied five years from now what does success look like to you what would be, what would be a, a real objective uh, or subjective feeling or something that you see to you about what you studied who wants to go first i can go first i feel that in five years it being successful is seeing the diversity within the actual physical therapy world right seeing mm-hmm. those increase in numbers within the minority groups increase in patient outcomes and whatnot. Once we see that, once we see that we can establish this understanding and relatedness with those individuals in our, within our patient population, then I think that's when we'll see a success rate in this. Boom. Smart. Yeah. Smart to go first, because that was a great <laughs> <laughs> What was that number again? Because you had the statistic in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, um, uh, student physical therapists and um, oh, that was actually Stephanie. Yeah, that was me. There are 1.5% black physical therapists and there's 3.8% black 
black student physical therapists. And that's comparing to approximately 13% of the population is black. Yeah. So Amy, go smart, go right for that objective. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, if you can't measure it, how do you know if it's, if it's gotten yeah. done, right? Um, who, who else has got something? And again, not everything has to be objective, right? It could be a feeling. It could be hearing different answers um, um, in, in an interview similar to what you've done. So who wants to go next? Yeah, I would, I'll go next. <laughs> so I would say I would love to see more support groups within PT programs. Because mm -hmm. uh, really looking into like the isolation that I talked about, the, a program makes so much of a difference. And I know it sounds like such a complicated idea, but I, these I feel like these times right now are really pushing towards that. It's like, what, what do you need? Like you need a safe space that uh, black students and minority students can, can talk. And, and there's a few programs in a few different universities, but it's not a common thing throughout all programs. And I think that would truly make a difference in providing that space where their voices are heard, where they can find the connection if they're not fully uh, meeting it in, in their classrooms and with their faculty. I like that. All right, here we go. We're down to Marcia and Stephanie. Do you want to go first, Marcia, or do you want me to go? I have to. I think I'll go with the maybe the first one. Uh, I think for me, in five years, success looks like better patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. Because time and time and time again, you look at the numbers and you see how, even with the whole COVID-19 situation, you see how it disproportionately affects minority, um, mm -hmm. and particularly black people. And every time I say it, like, I'm not gonna cry, but every time I say it, my heart breaks and I'm tired. And so to me, success in five years look like healthcare providers that are so culturally competent and so understanding that they listen to their patients' complaints, that don't come with implicit bias, bias, and they don't let the bias affect the care that the patient receives. Um, so to me, success in five year in five years look like like minority people dying as, at a way lower rate because of poor health outcomes than they are like right now. Mm -hmm. Wow, well said. All right, Stephanie, no pressure. You get That's to a tough follow-up, follow man. <laughs> um, I'll keep mine more specific to PT education. Um, from an institutional level, I feel like it looks like not being afraid to have these conversations. It needs to be education on white privilege. It needs to be education on the social determinants of health. It needs to be education on the history of racism in the healthcare system. Because if you look, there's a pretty deep history of racism, even in the healthcare field, which is sad, but it's the reality of our history. Um, and then furthermore, it, I wanna see an environment where black SPTs feel like they can be truly themselves. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what that looks like from a practical standpoint, but I don't think that that should be an added stress to being successful PT. So maybe that means we aren't so strict in our definition of what a PT looks like or sounds like or speaks like, mm -hmm. but we got to open our minds. So mm -hmm. I hope that that will be one aspect of success and then add in everyone else's answers as well. I don't know what grade you guys got in this uh, project, but uh, <laughs> you, you talked about it really, okay. early, and I didn't prep you for uh, for that question right there on three questions from our friends from Arius Medical Staffing. Again, that's at ureusmedical.com. I heard measure it, right? That's what I heard. Measure it. We're going to measure something to make sure this is getting done. If, if okay. it feels better, but it isn't better, it's not better. Mm -hmm. um, create a network of support right? That sounds like a very physical therapy thing to do. So let's create a place where you can feel safe to, to be able to rehabilitate whatever you're talking about. Um, increase, I like how Marcia goes right for someone else. Like you didn't, you, you, you let off by saying increased patient outcomes. You weren't even talking, like you literally put yourself second. You were saying, well, I hope the patients have better outcomes. So I heard that. So good on you for doing that and making sure that then physical therapist, then you turned it back to us we're more socially competent. Mm -hmm. That should be a baseline. That's inc that's raising the that's raising the floor, yep. not yet raising the ceiling. But I like raising mm -hmm. that floor. We should be better than competent, but mm -hmm. we're not there yet. So we need to get that right. So mm -hmm. I like how we, you you focus on raising that floor, and then within s you know within physical therapy education, Stephanie wraps it up beautifully with comfortable being yourself. If you're not comfortable with with being yourself for two or three years uh, in PT school. That's exhausting. You might not make it. Even when you do make it through the program, how long are you going to stick around in a profession that you can't be yourself in? This doesn't necessarily, this doesn't stop as soon as you graduate. Mm -hmm. 
right? We can't be that blind, right? You focused on student physical therapists because you had to narrow your focus for a study. You can't be that blind to think that this doesn't exist outside and everywhere else in people's lives. Yep. Um, yeah. so, so comfortable to be yourself. Yeah. In a, in a classroom. I mean, come on, that should be the bare, that's the minimum, right? Yep. That should be the minimum. It's yep. not. Let's be very clear about it. It is not. Mm -hmm. um, so good on you guys. Those are fantastic answers for uh, for three questions. So great job. Now we're going to do the parting shot. Let's do that. This one I gave you a heads up for. <laughs> <laughs> Our friends from the uh, Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy uh, giving you your parting shot. Uh, if you want to be a leader in orthopedic physical therapy, first of all, a member of APTA, and you got to become the, um, a member of that, that academy. Leaders in orthopedic physical therapy, they're right in the CPGs, available at orthopt.org. Uh, a lot of their um, um, courses, like the current concepts of orthopedic physical therapy, uh, available there orthopt.org. So if you think about orthopedics or if that's a piece of your practice, do it in the lead. It's, it's the easiest sell ever, right? If you want to be a great orthopt, the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapists, it's in their name. Uh, so the parting shot, this is your mic drop moment. What you want to leave us with, you get to decide in what order you go. Ladies, it's on you. Who wants to go first? I'll, I'll go first again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that. So yeah, I'd like to say that change begins with ourselves, right? Take it upon yourself to start conversations and take the time to self-reflect and identify those internal biases and find a voice, become an ally, because it is then when you will maybe make an impact and influence someone else and inspire someone else to also voice their opinions and also be an, be an ally. Yeah, make sure you're an ally. That's, that's fantastic. It's a great parting shot. Who's up next? Yeah, I'll go next. Uh, so I've been really inspired by TED Talks recently. It's just really important to, to really inform yourself and listen to, to people speak about these concepts. And the one that really impacted me was one uh, called Allegories of Race and Racism by Camara, Camara Jones. And she pretty much spoke about the different levels of racism. And there's an institutionalized level from assaulting from the historical separation of slavery and then a personally mediated level, which is us. It's assumptions and conscious biases. And then an internalized level, which is uh, minorities devaluing themselves because of their experiences. So it pretty much shows that racism isn't just one thing. It, it, we need to work at it from different angles. And we need to look at our own unconscious biases. We need to become comfortable with the uncomfortable conversation of race. And we just need to provide a space for these voices to be heard. And we need to learn from those experiences. Well said. Uh, who's up next? Parting shot. I'll go next. Um, Amy and Andrea already kind of spoke to the implicit bias aspect of it. But I think a huge, huge part of it is just listening. Um, when BIPOC people talk about their experiences, you need to listen and not make any assumptions or judgments and listen with the intention of understanding. Um, I was honestly kind of disappointed when I saw in the DPT student Facebook page how many people said, this is political, this is not the place wow. for this. Like, this is not political, this is a human rights issue. And if you think as a PT, this doesn't affect your coworkers or your patients or anyone around you, you're kidding yourself. And we're supposed to be people that want to learn throughout our careers. So the best way to do that is through listening and giving people a platform to tell their stories. So that would be my take home. I like that. Well said. All right, Marcia. Yeah, no. <laughs> I love everything that uh, Steph said because it's so true. We're kidding ourselves if we think that we can be empathetic healthcare providers if we don't gain a deep appreciation and understanding for the issues that affect our patients, our students, our coworkers, and all of our friends. So I think my parting words would just be really to like challenge people to look at who's around them and see if they can if they have diverse friends, well, if, if everyone around you looks like you, try to see if you can have some <laughs> diversity around you. Because if everyone is like you, then you're only thinking one way. Um, but just like engage in conversations, like be uncomfortable at first, you won't die, you'll be okay, you'll grow. <laughs> have the conversations um, because from really like, like engaging with someone that thinks completely different than you, engaging with someone that has an ex life experience that's completely different than you, 
that's that's where the good stuff happens. That's where the magic happens. That's where we learn and that's where we grow. So I guess my parting words is just challenging people to engage with people around them that are different than them so that we can all learn and be better. Well said. Uh, I want to put uh, put our hands together for you guys. Thank you guys so much for, number one, doing this research, um, for 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 having those uncomfortable conversations and 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 for putting those people at ease to be able to be themselves and speak freely and then putting so much time effort uh and energy in in this project and and letting it come out and then for coming on here and sharing it with us so thank you guys thank you for having thank us. you for having us all right ladies uh this will not be the last time we have you on the show we will put a link in the comments as well we'll make sure that if anyone is watching the replay they can drop a question or a comment and it will come yeah. directly to you guys as well. Perfect. So um, this will not be la this will not be. And I will say that again, this will not be the last time we have conversations like this uh, on this show, because without the conversations, the uncomfortableness, there will be no change. Uh, okay. Ladies from Texas State, thank you guys so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.